Welcome back friends! I'm here at the Mixkimming waterfront today exploring all the really cool, unique, and different creatures and things that are captivating my attention today. Like the school of catfish and oh my goodness there's a bigger fish over there too right now I just saw swimming by. And these are so neat for me because I'm normally out at the Bill Mason Center where we have the vanishing pond and the human made lake. Did you hear that? That was a fish jumping. It totally startled me. And at the Bill Mason Center, we don't have fish, uh, especially not catfish or pumpkin fish like some of these fish are. And I find that so amazing that here in the city of Ottawa, we have so many different types of wetlands that we can experience. Uh, today, the instructors are going to introduce us to a few more creatures that we find either here at the river or at some of the ponds. And I'm really excited for you to be back and joining with us again. So let's see what the instructors have for us today. Hello, last time we got together, we looked at a couple of different wetlands here at Mex Gimming. Uh, ephemeral pond in the forest and then that man-made pond out in one of our old farm fields. Now I'm down at the Ottawa River. Sometimes when we're collecting, we may not catch the creature itself, but evidence of its existence. For instance, look at this thing that looks just like a dried shell. Now I know because that's in the water that there are dragonflies here. And to really know that, you've got to understand the life cycle of a dragonfly. So let's take a closer look at that now. Adult dragonflies lay their eggs in the water around here, and then those eggs hatch and they develop into the larva or the nymphal form of the dragonfly. And we can find that on the bottom of our pond or at the, the lake here, moving around and just feeding as it grows. And they have this sort of a hinged lower jaw that can shoot out and grab their prey. And they're one of the, the big predators here in this ecosystem. Eventually they'll grow large enough that they'll crawl up out of the water and onto nearby vegetation and their exoskeleton, the shape that they have now, is kind of like a cocoon. They develop inside into an adult dragonfly that crawls out of its skin, literally splits down the middle, crawls out and pumps fluid from its body throughout its wings to expand them. Once they harden after sitting in the in the air for a while there, then we have a new adult dragonfly flying around us. That's what I see all around me here now. Keep your eyes open for him near you. One creature was way too fast for us to examine in the first video. So let's take a closer look now. The shiny black beetle that is quickly whirling about in the bucket is called a whirligig beetle. They help keep the surface of the water clean by feeding on all the dead insects that fall and float on the surface. There's a couple really cool things about the whirly gig beetle. One is that they actually have one eye that sees above the surface of the water and one eye that sees below underneath water. Another really neat thing is that they can attach an air bubble to the end of their abdomen so that they can dive underwater and still breathe. So they may be feeling threatened, so they're going to seek safety or in search of more food. And they carry that oxygen bubble underneath with them, kind of like a human with a scuba diving tank. So this little creature is not one to be scared of. This is called a water mite, a relative of spiders, velvet mites, all those other little creatures. This is one on the larger side. They tend to be, you know, one to six millimeters. Um, they eat small crustaceans, little worms, larvae, plankton, and they're fun little creatures to watch as they swim through the pond and bucket. Welcome to a place that's located just on the southeast side of the Bill Mason Center property known as the Human Made Lake. Now we named it that because it was created by humans, it's not natural. So this used to be a forest and at some point we needed a resource from this land that existed underneath the forest and that was sand. If you see just to the side of me, there's quite a lot of sand along the shore. This is a beautiful beach-like environment and so 
The forest was cut down, the sand was dug up and taken away for the building project, and a hole was left behind. And because there's a lot of water surrounding this site, um, wetlands on either side, the um, hole eventually filled up with water and it has now become this lake that we see behind us and it's also become a new home to all sorts of creatures that couldn't live here before. The lake is surrounded by deciduous trees. Each fall the leaves drop off and many of them go to the bottom of the lake where they cover the sandy bottom and provide a nice home for many of the animals that live there. There are a few plants that grow within the lake but for the most part, it's a sandy bottom and it's easy to see through the water. It's also very slow moving. There's no uh, river or stream entering or flowing from this body of water. Because there is no flowing water or river or stream that pours into or out of the man-made lake, there are no fish here. But there are a bunch of other creatures from insects to mammals and amphibians that call this place home. The shallow, warm water with limited predators makes this a really great nursery for a lot of the creatures that we've been exploring in the other ponds, as well as some different ones. There is one really cool creature here that I'm so excited to get to show you. So I'm gonna do a pond dip and then let's take a look at what we've found. How cool are these creatures? Do you recognize this animal or have you seen something that sort of looks like it before? This is the red spotted newt and it's actually a type of salamander that spends most of its life in the water. Now let's take a look at an overview of the newt life cycle. It is very similar to that of a frog life cycle. In this diagram you can see that the adults will lay eggs the eggs will hatch and then there will be a larva stage. Here is a video clip of a newt larva that we found in one of the other ephemeral ponds. It's kind of cool to see the newt larva next to the tadpoles because you can see a few major differences. Um, and the gills that are on the newt larva, those hairy like structures coming off near the head of the larva are how it breathes underwater during this aquatic stage of its life. By the end of the summer or after about three months from the time that the eggs have hatched, this larva is gonna go into the next stage of its life. Those gills will absorb back into its body it will change color to a bright orange and then it is ready for the next three to four years to be spent on land as a terrestrial red eft. Now if you take a look at a few of these photos, the red eft stands out and really contrasts with its background or its surroundings. Why do you think it would have this bright orange color that is quite noticeable? I'll let you figure that one out on your own or as a class. This terrestrial phase allows populations to mix and for newts to move from one body of water to another. After about two to three years on land, this juvenile red eft is ready to become an adult and move back to the water full time. It changes its color yet again and becomes a duller olivey green color. It still has its spots, but they aren't quite as vibrant as they were in the red eft stage. Another significant change is that its tail becomes more blade-like, sort of like a canoe paddle or the tail on a fish, which will allow it to swim quickly through the water to catch prey such as insects, small mollusks, young amphibians, worms, and even frog eggs, or to get away from predators. Many of you had questions about tadpoles from our last video. You wondered whether or not they have a home or shelter. And where do tadpoles live? Well, tadpoles will spend most of their time in the weeds or uh, near the bottom of the pond. They will hide from predators in the mud and come up to the surface for air when they need it. You also wondered what tadpoles eat. Tadpoles will eat algae, 
and plant matter in the water. And then as they begin to grow, they may eat plant leaves, mosses, small bugs, or insects. Now, last week, we looked at the wood frog, green frog, and spring peeper tadpoles that might grow in the ephemeral pond. And this is what they looked like, if you remember. This week, I'm going to take you down to the river at McSkimming and see what type of tadpoles are growing in there. Let's take a look. These tadpoles I scooped out of the Ottawa River at McSkimming. Notice they look quite different from the ones that we found in the ephemeral pond. They have a greeny yellow color to them and they have dark spots on their back. These tadpoles are bullfrog tadpoles and they will grow to be four to six inches before they begin to change into frogs. They can take from one to three years or even longer to develop into frogs. The longer it takes for them to develop into frogs, the larger they will become, which means they have more of a chance of survival. Bullfrogs can live to be 10 years old, but most bullfrogs in the wild live to be between five and six years old. You'll notice here that I've caught frogs that are in two different stages of life. Let's take a closer look at the stages that the bullfrog will go through before it becomes an adult. Just like the tadpoles in the pond, bullfrog tadpoles start as eggs laid on the surface of the water. Then they will develop into a tadpole without legs. Then you can see that this tadpole has very small back legs started to develop. This tadpole has fully developed back legs. Now this one has legs in the front and the back, but see how long its tail is? Now this one has started to absorb its tail and soon it will turn into an adult bullfrog like this one. We find bullfrogs here at the waterfront and not in the ephemeral pond in the forest because bullfrogs need a much longer time to develop into adults. They need one to three years to complete their life cycle from egg to a full adult. If they lived in the ephemeral pond, they wouldn't have enough time to develop before the pond dried up. How can you tell the bullfrog apart from other frogs? Well, the bullfrog is Ontario's largest frog and it can grow up to 17 centimeters long. The bullfrog has a rounded mouth. It has no dorsolateral ridges. That's the ridges that run all the way along a frog's back. It has a very large external eardrum called a tympanum and it's larger than the frog's eye. During mating season, the males also have a bright yellow chin. Bullfrogs will eat just about anything that will fit in its mouth. Insects, small birds, fish, snakes, tadpoles, small turtles, crustaceans, aquatic plants. You may also recognize the bullfrog by the sound it makes. I hope this week you've had a chance to learn something new or discover something new that lives in some of our wetlands. I personally never even thought about the fact that there'd be baby catfish here in the Ottawa River at Max Skimming. So fun. Have you ever thought though why wetlands are so important to our ecosystems? Did you realize that some of the plants can absorb nutrients and other things that actually aren't good for the water and help to keep it clean? Many wetlands absorb so much of the water that it can help prevent or minimize the effects of flooding. Wetlands are also nurseries for all of these baby creatures that we've been exploring with you, as well as so many more. And if they're nurseries, it also means that they're food sources. Just a moment ago, I'm pretty certain a frog might have eaten one of those baby catfish.
It happens though, it is part of the life cycles. Wetlands also provide water, not only for the plants that grow here, the creatures that live in the water, but for many other animals to come and visit to stay hydrated and healthy as well. Wetlands are also amazing resting places for migratory birds. Both of our centers have dedicated areas that are protected for this reason specifically. We're really glad that you've had a chance to come and join us as we've explored all of these creatures that live and grow in the waters, not just in our vanishing ponds, but in our lakes and our river systems as well. Thanks so much for joining us again this week, and we really hope that you tune in next week for our summer bucket list challenge, where some of our instructors are going to let you know what we're going to be doing this summer and maybe give you some challenges to try some new activities. Thanks so much for joining in.